How's it going guys, Amazing Animal Adventures, and today is episode 3 of an introduction to snake morphs. So today we're going to be talking about recessive morphs. Recessive morphs are very, very different, just in the way they respond genetically. Now, a recessive morph is recessive to dominant, codominant, normals, everything. So the only way for a recessive morph to actually be portrayed in the phenotype is for it to take up the entire genotype. And I'll, th that'll make sense as we go along. Now because uh, recessive morphs are recessive, they are not represented with capital letters like all the other morphs and genes. Instead, they're re represented with lowercase letters to show that they're lower, they're recessive. Now, what I have with me here is my albino western hognose snake. Uh, albino is a recessive morph. To start us off in our pineout squares, let's try breeding a albino hognose snake to a normal hognose snake and see how that looks in the pineout square. So here we have our two parents, our AA genotype and our NN genotype which is albino and normal. Uh, like I said, our albino, it needs to be filling up both of those genotype slots because if there's anything else in there, it would be recessive to that and the phenotype would not be albino, it would be whatever else was there. Uh, because albino is recessive to everything else, just like any other recessive gene, so it needs to be filling up both of those spaces. And uh, of course, the recessive gene is represented by the lowercase letters. And then of course, we have our ever familiar NN, which is just a normal ball python. Let's have, head over to our normal Punnett square. We can lay our genotypes types across the sides. In the first slot, we see NA. Now, what exactly does this mean? We'll discuss that after we finish filling in the Punnett square. We've got NA again. In fact, all of these will be NAs. So let's talk about the results of that breeding project. We see this NA genotype type that we haven't seen before. What does this genotype type mean and what is its phenotype? We already said that recessive is always recessive to anything else. So when you have a recessive and a normal, the normal is going to be dominant over the recessive. So all of these NAs, even though they have that albino gene in there, they're all just going to look normal because the normal is dominant over the recessive, always. So whenever there's that normal gene that gets in there, it'll always be stronger than the recessive gene. So what we have here is something we would call a het for albino. It's heterozygous for that albino gene, but we don't actually see it portrayed in the phenotype. They're generally called hets for short. So, now the next step is to actually produce an albino animal. How do we do that? Well, let's say we were to breed two different hets together, two albino heterozygous animals together. Let's see how that comes out. So here are our two genotypes, NA and NA, which are both heterozygous for albino, or just het albinos. We can lay them across the Punnett square. The first square comes out as NN, which we know is normal. We have two NAs, so those are two heterozygous for albino specimens. And finally, we produce an AA, or a fully albino animal. So we can see that by combining these two het for albino specimens, we can produce a fully albino even though there's no albino in their actual phenotype because of their genotype we can produce full albino animals hey you can breed two heterozygous for albino animals together and you will have a 25 percent chance of producing an albino as well as a 50 percent chance of uh, producing hets there's one more scenario i want to touch on um what if you were to breed a full albino to a full albino well if you think about it you're gonna have your aa on the bottom aa on the side and in the middle, what's it going to be? It's all going to be A's. You're going to produce just a bunch of AAAs. It's just all albinos, 100%. So yeah, that is a sure way to produce a bunch more albinos. But keep in mind, it's also going to be more expensive to get to full albinos to start with. So when you're in a breeding program, there's always that give or take, depending on how you want to do this. 
Well guys, that's about it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed learning about recessive morphs with me. Uh, recessive morphs are probably the most complicated type of morph there, so if you understood this, then you're good to go. Next week, I think we will start talking about s specific types of morphs. We'll probably dive into ball python specifically and just talk about some of the morphs there now that you understand what each of these kinds are and how they're produced and how they respond genetically. We can start actually talking about, you know, the individual morphs and how they work together. Thank you.